Residents are urged to join the honoring of a WW2 airman who will be laid to rest. The village is pop course to perform in special 10-year anniversary concert. Beer drinking DOI suspect arrested at where? Wawa. Fillory accused of tormenting her neighbors hires a lawyer who defended Ed McGinty. Villager serves three days in jail after skipping a probation appointment. Gulf officials attempt to explain to residents about course conditions. Florida's new license plate will celebrate the villages. Poker players in the villages complain they've gotten a raw deal. A villager claims he stumbled upon images of child porn found in his home. More unlicensed drivers from foreign countries. Villager, mocked as troll, gains powerful ally in battle over anonymous complaints. Dead couple's abandoned home in the village is now facing $50,000 in fines. Letters to the editor. How many holes in ones of golf did we get this week? This and more. Coming up. This week's news is brought to you by my YouTube and Patreon members. In late 1944, Stevens was assigned to the 557th Bombardment Squadron, 387th Bombardment Group, 9th U.S. Air Force in the European Theater of Operations. On December 23rd, Stevens was a crew member aboard a B-26F Marauder aircraft nicknamed the Shirley D, which was shot down by anti-aircraft fire over Bitburg, Germany, while returning from a bombing raid. Witness reported Shirley D took damage to the right engine, resulting in a massive fire which forced crewmen to bail out. Survivors watched Shirley D crash near Winville, Belgium, with several crew members, including Stevens, still aboard. A few days after the crash, several Belgian residents recovered one set of remains from the crash site near Hamont and turned them over to the American forces operating in the area. American Graves Registration Services personnel initially identified the pilot, while the other set of remains remained unknown. By December 26, 1944, everyone from Stevens Aircraft had been identified in accounted for except for Stevens, and he was declared non-recoverable. In 2013, Defense POW MIA Accounting Agency personnel returned to the crash site near Winville, Belgium, where they recovered materials associated with the crash B-26. Later in 2019, while working in conjunction with researchers from the University of Wisconsin, possible remains were located and sent to the DPAA laboratory for testing and possible identification. There'll be a motorcycle escort from Bushnell to the Florida National Cemetery, but for those who are unable to join the escort, they can stand along the side of the road of State Road 48 in Bushnell between U.S. 301 and Hayes Road or along County Road 476 and County Road 476B on the route to the cemetery at approximately 12.30 p.m. Those supporting the effort are encouraged to bring American flags and let the family know that the Stevens sacrifice is being honored. The public is also invited to go directly to the cemetery to attend the 1 p.m. internment services at the assembly area. Those who attend are encouraged to arrive by noon, but no later than 12.40 p.m. A flyover is planned during the service. Stephen's daughter, who was only 18 months old when he was killed in action in 1944, will be in the escort to attend her father's internment service. What can you say? The sacrifices they made then for us today. 
The Village of Pop Course to perform a special 10-year anniversary concert. The Village of Pop Course is celebrating its 10-year anniversary with a special spring concert featuring some of your favorite songs from the past concerts and new songs with wonderful arrangements. Sing 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 will be presented on Monday, April the 8th at North Lake Presbyterian Church at 975 Rolling Acres Road in Lady Lake. The 3 p.m. concert is already sold out, but tickets remain for the 6 p.m. concert. Enjoy Academy Award winning songs from the movies like Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz and I've Had the Time of My Life from Dirty Dancing. Listen to beautiful standards like My Funny Valentine and Blue Velvet. Tap your toes to the opening number Sing 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 made famous by Benny Goodman and a fun arrangement of Blue Moon. Add a Grammy winning song, Songs from Broadway, more great standards and hits from the 30s to 70s and it's sure to be a wonderful concert. The chorus will be accompanied by a 12 piece Pop Course Band. All tickets are $15 a general admission and can be purchased online at thevillagespops.thundertix.com and in person on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. at Bridgeport Recreation Center. A beer drinking drunk driving suspect was arrested at Wawa. Cody Jarrett Lanier, 24, of Lady Lake, was driving an older model pickup in the wee hours Saturday when he failed to come to a complete stop at the stop sign at the exit of the Oxford Downs poker room on US-301 in Oxford. A deputy pulled over Lanier's pickup at the Wawa gas station at County Road 466 in US-301. It appeared Lanier had been drinking. Three sealed bottles of Modelo beer and one Yingling beer were found in the truck. An empty Modelo beer bottle was found in the bed of the truck and it was still cold to the touch. A marijuana cigarette was also found in the truck. Lanier struggled through field sobriety exercises. He refused to provide breast samples. He was arrested on charges of driving under the influence and possession of marijuana. He was booked at the Sumter County Detention Center after posting a $1,000 bond. A villager accused of tormenting her neighbors has hired the attorney who successfully defended Ed McGinty in a political war with a fellow neighbor. Susa Barr, 77, of the village of Santa Domingo, is facing a charge of stalking following her arrest in February. This past week, Barr entered a plea of not guilty in the case via her lawyer, J. Melanie Slaughter, who made headlines in 2022 when she won an acquittal for McGinty, who was also accused of stalking. That's the update. For her, I'm not going to say anything about ads. Don't even bring it up. You can only drag a guy through the mud so many times and it's been enough. Here's another update from last week. A villager served three days in jail after violating his probation by skipping appointments with his assigned officer. Paul David Stone, 57, of the Audrey Villas in the village of Amelia was released Friday from the Lake County Jail. Stone was arrested last month by Sumter County Sheriff's Deputy during a search for a drunk pedestrian in the village of Amelia. A deputy discovered that Stone was wanted on a warrant charging him with violating his probation. Stone had been placed on probation following a disturbance last year at a laundromat in La Plaza Grande in the Spanish Springs area of the villages. The New York native skipped three appointments with his probation officer, prompting the warrant for his arrest. After weeks of complaints from frustrated residents, golf officials in the villages had a chance to answer some hard questions about the condition of the courses in the villages. Executive Director of Golf Operations, David Williams and Executive Director of Golf Maintenance, Mitch Leninger, both took to the podium Wednesday morning to answer pointed questions from residents during the Amenity Authority meeting at Savannah Center. Both men present a PowerPoint presentation to explain golf operations, the challenges being faced. Williams has worked in golf for 20 years in the villages. Most of his years were spent at the developer-owned Cane Gardens Championship course. Last year, a major change moved all golf employees over to the district payroll, and Williams assumed a new title under the district's new lineup. Williams pointed out that there are now 57 golf courses in the villages, 44 executive courses, and 13 championship courses. There are also four putt and play courses, 48 practice greens. Millions of rounds of golf are played each year in the villages. He said there are 1,000 people who work in the golf and tennis operations. Most are part-timers and most of them are residents. They are very dedicated. 
Linear listed a number of challenges faced in golf course maintenance, including weather, aging courses, labor contracts, and the quality of irrigation. Property Owners Association of the Village's president, Cliff Weiner, pushed Leninger on a topic of overseeding. Leninger admitted the practice of overseeding in the winter has been abandoned in part because it required a lot of water. He said four courses are currently closed for rest and rehabilitation. Bacaw, Bonita Pass, Pelican, Redfish Run. Residents attending the AAC meeting appeared to be receptive to the information. However, they said the lack of communication on what has become the hottest point in the villages made the problem even worse. What is frustrating is probably the lack of information, said villager Joe Heffernan. I think you need to acknowledge courses are not in the great shape. And they're not. They never are this time of year. This is nothing new. It, I just think it's got a little worse. Could be because of weather. The overseeding thing, I didn't know that until I just read that. That's a major deal. I don't know any golf courses that doesn't overseed. <music> a new license plate will celebrate the villages. The state senate this week, in a unanimous vote, approved several specialty license plates, including those honoring Florida's friendliest hometown and the late Jimmy Buffett. The State House passed the bill on February 22 by a vote of 108 to 6. The village's license plate will include the phrase, May all your dreams come true. Didn't Walt Disney say that when he opened up the Disney Park? All fees collected through the license plate will benefit the village's charter school. The bill is awaiting the signature of Governor Ron DeSantis. Poker players in the villages are complaining they have been given a raw deal. Fans of Texas Hold'em and other games lined up at the podium at Wednesday's Amenity Authority Committee meeting at Savannah Center. They claimed that their card games were abruptly canceled after disruptive behavior of a renter in connection with a card game at Laurel Manor Recreation Center. Poker players defended the social aspects of their card games but were outraged that their games were shut down by Recreation Director John Rohan. The decision to end these games is uncalled for, said villager Bill Johnson. I am calling for a review of Mr. Rohan's employment. I think he needs to resign. He's been here long enough. Sander Jones of the village of St. Catherine, who previously lived in the villages, but moved away before moving back, was also after Rohan's scalp. I think it's time Mr. Rohan rehired. We need some new blood in here. However, AAC Chair Donna Kempa was forceful in her defense of Rohan, the longtime director of recreation in the villages. She said residents' anger was misdirected. John did not make the rule. He was enforcing the rule. He is unfairly bearing the brunt of this. Kempa allowed the poker players complaining to go on for nearly an hour, later explaining that she thought it was important for the residents to be allowed to air their grievances. And it is, but I think an hour is a bit long. What happens is, you get four people up there complaining about something, they inevitably end up doing is repeating what the guy before them just said. So you hear the same thing over and over and over again to where you really need to shut it down. However, golfers who were at the meeting for an entirely different reason and wanted to object to course conditions finally complained about the poker players and said it was time for them to sit down. District Counsel Kevin Stone explained that state statute prohibits gambling regardless of the amount at district-owned recreation facilities. His explanation only prompted more questions. What about Bunko? What about 50-50 drawings? Officials said that playing cards is allowed at recreation centers, although gambling is not. Residents were told that they could reapply for those rooms they have previously used, but must pledge that no gambling will take place. A villager claimed he stumbled upon numerous images of child pornography found at his home. Michael Henry Roseman, 69, was arrested Tuesday at his home at 5450 Dre Drive in the village of Bradford on 30 counts of possession of child pornography. A warrant was issued after law enforcement paid a visit to Roseman's home in February. Microsoft had flagged suspected pornographic activity with the Internet protocol associated with Roseman's address. When law enforcement began speaking to Roseman, he, he said he understood why they were there and said he had stumbled upon several images depicting minor children engaged in sexual activity. The Roseman was transported to the Wildwood Police Department for a formal interview, which was audio and video recorded. Roseman said he did not want to hide anything. He said he began to research incest in a form of pornography. He said he had been viewing the material for 10 years and would often masturbate while watching it. He described where the images could be found on an external hard drive at his home. The images recovered at Roseman's home depicted children, both boys and girls, 
this, some as young as three years old. Now that's sick. The children were involved in sexual situations with other children and with adults. Information about the activity that happened next in the video has been redacted from the arrest report. That must have really been bad for him to redact it. Roseman and his wife purchased their home in the villages in 2020. He was booked at some kind of detention center where he was being held without bond. Good. Man, where do these people come from? An unlicensed driver from Mexico was arrested after he was caught exceeding the speed limit by 20 miles per hour. Name will be in the picture. 30 of Kissimmee was driving a white Ford van at about 8.30 a.m. Sunday on U.S. Highway 27 and 441 at Shadow Hill Drive when he was caught on radar traveling at 71 miles per hour in a 50 mile per hour zone. Lazaro said he has been in the United States for two years and tried to claim he had obtained a driver's license in Georgia. The officer who initiated the traffic stop could not find any record that Lazaro had obtained a driver's license in Georgia or anywhere else in the United States. He was arrested on a charge of driving without a license and issued a ticket for speed he was booked out to Lake County Jail and released after posting a $500 bond once again. No license, probably no insurance. What happened to his car? Did he take his car and drive it home? Was it towed in like anybody else's would be? Did he have to pay tow, storage? Never in the report. Hello, my name is Craig Morris, and you've probably seen me on a few appearances of Skip Smith's Wednesday Night Live YouTube channel. I'm bringing a message to you today uh, based on an observation I've made over the last few months. That's the fact that more and more people are moving to the villages in the north central Florida area who have not retained 65 years of age yet. And because of the ability to work remotely and doing a real good job of saving for retirement, most of these people are actually moving up their timeline and taking advantage of the world's friendliest hometown uh, here in North Central Florida. So I wanted to let you know that there is a solution. It's something I call a bridge policy, which will take you from your current age, under 65, right up until Medicare, where we can switch over. The best way to find out the details about that is for me to get to know a little bit more about you and your needs. So if you have retired and your coverage is lapsing, or maybe you have an employer who doesn't offer health insurance, just contact me. Uh, we'll sit down, I'll interview you, and then come up with probably at least three unbiased side-by-side -side comparisons so that you'll have some options to choose from. My name is Craig Morrison. I sell health insurance. Do you want to know more? A villager marked as a troll has gained a powerful ally in her battle for the return of the amenity of the anonymity when it comes to deed compliance complaints. M. Ruppert of the Sweet Gum Villas in the village of Fenny was before the Community Development District 12 Board of Supervisors in February carrying a large cardboard troll sign which had been deposited in her yard by an apparently angry neighbor. The irony is that Ruppert was not an anonymous complainer or troll because she abided by CDD 12's requirement that she provide her name, phone number, and address when she lodged a complaint about dog excrement in her neighbor's yard. I seem to be the poster child for the subject right now, Rupert said, when she was back before the board Thursday morning at Everglades Recreation Center. She has asked the CDD-12 return to the anonymous complaint system to prevent other residents from facing the type of retribution she has been enduring. She says she has been relentlessly mocked on social media and ostracized by many of her neighbors. Well, shame on him. You're just being childish. This has created such a division in our community, Rupert said. Rupert has gained a powerful ally, retired Lake County Judge Terry Neal, who now serves as a deed compliance special hearing master for CDD-12. Neal noted that she really understands the issue, particularly because she is also a resident of the village of Finney. I love living in the villages. One of the great things about living in the villages is your neighbors. But if you have a neighbor problem, it's a whole different experience, Neil said. She said that CDD-12 board's decision to force those lodging deed compliance complaints to reveal their name, address, and phone number has backfired. It's pitting neighbor against neighbor, Neil said. Miss Ruppert had a sign put in her yard by somebody who wanted to remain anonymous, but she did not get to remain anonymous. However, the board was voted to make the change requiring providing name, phone number, and address this past fall isn't ready to reverse the course. Supervisor David Robbins, who has been on the board for three and a half years, said he has heard displeasure with the anonymous complaint system throughout the entire tenure on the board. He 
people just grasp on what other people say. Example, the villages is the STD capital of the world. Remember that? And half the people that said that, never been here. I don't think we should change this willy-nilly. We need to give it a chance, and then we would be able to say we tried and this just didn't work, Robin said. How long has it been? He and other supervisors noted that at the time they voted to abandon anonymous complaints, they had agreed to monitor the situation for a year, analyzing data and residents' reactions. You're getting it. Supervisor Phil Montavo agreed to state, of course, particularly since the board would have to repeat the very same public hearing process that followed last year, and they voted to end the anonymous complaint system and required complainants to identify themselves. There was a public hearing. Everybody had a shot at it, Montavo said. That's true. An opening date has been announced for the new PGA Tour Superstore at Lady Lake Commons. The new store is set to open its doors 9 a.m. Saturday, April 6th. There will be $30,000 in giveaways for the first guests in line, including drivers, iron sets, putters, as well as range finders and other tech gear, apparel, footwear, lessons, and more. The store passed its final inspection this week, according to the officials in Lady Lake. There is still interior work taking place. The building was originally occupied by Earth Fair, which closed its doors in 2022. Well, good luck to all you guys that's going to go over there at 4 o'clock in the morning and stand in line to get some free shit. Florida Highway Patrol has reissued a plea for the public's help in search for a vehicle that struck and killed a pedestrian in February on US 301 in Sumter County. Mike Berry, 63, of Lake Mary, died after being hit by a vehicle on US 301 south of County Road 102 near Brown and Brown Farms and Country Store. Berry was a former reporter for the Orlando Sentinel. Body was found at 8 a.m. February 17th, and Florida Highway Patrol investigators believe the accident occurred sometime the previous night. Florida Highway Patrol troopers continue to seek the public's help in a search for a 92 to a 97 Ford Bronco F-Series Ford pickup truck that is missing its left front headlight. Anyone with information about this incident, please call Florida Highway Patrol 347 or Crime Stoppers at TIPS or 8477. An abandoned home in the village is now facing $50,000 in fines, and there appears to be no resolution. I've showed this two or three times. Fines keep going higher and higher and higher. Somebody owns this home. big problem here in the village is, is, and I don't know if this home is one of them, reverse mortgages. Once the person dies, the house has no value at that point, and they just seem to set. The fines are coming from... Because in that district, not every district, but in that district, the residents there are paying to have the yard mowed, bushes trimmed, and the house washed. That's all they'll do. But over a period of a year, uh, two years, and three years, this is how it comes up to $50,000 in fines. The home is located at 2016 Cordero Court in the village of Santa Domingo. The home is not in compliance because a junk car remains in the driveway. That would be another fine, not being in compliance. The home was purchased for $95,398 by John and Helen Fuller. They are deceased. The property which falls under the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Renewal continues to run up $50 daily fines for the car that is obviously inoperable and hasn't been moved in years. So what? There's an abandoned truck down here at one of our rec centers that's been sitting down there for a couple of years, and it doesn't move. It ain't got no license plates. It ain't got anything, and it just sits there. How's come that rec center ain't getting these daily fines? Huh? Some of this stuff around here is all one-sided. It is a disgrace. It is an abandoned property, Supervisor Jim Conti. And if your home next door is up for sale, what do you tell a buyer? Oh, the villages is finding them? Point. Hope has been that the home will eventually sell, and the CDD2 could collect its money at the time of the sale. The CDD2 is paying to cut the grass, and it has the authority to pressure wash the home as needed. Community Development District 2 Board will file a lawsuit against a non-compliant homeowner in the Sod versus Stone controversy that has rocked the La Crescenta Villas. They are not allowed to have stone in patio villas unless it came brand new with it. You're not allowed to pull up the grass and put in rock. We've announced this many times. I'm just trying to save you guys a real big headache if you do that. If you're buying a used patio villa, no matter where it is, there's stone in the front and no grass, you better make sure that that's 
that's been approved by the ARC or you're going to fall into the same problem. This past June, the CDD2 board in a special public hearing at Savannah Center ordered eight homeowners to remove the stone at their patio villas and replace it with sod. Most of the homeowners have come into compliance. La Crescenta Villa resident Gary Mang has not replaced his stone with sod and currently owes $6,587 in fines. He spoke out at Friday's CD2 board meeting at Savannah Center and defiantly vowed to keep his stone landscaping, once again reminding the supervisors that he bought the home with the stone already in place, unaware it was a violation. Mang's defiance prompted a fiery response from Supervisor Jim Conte. All we are doing is following the rules. We gave you 90 days to do it. And you didn't do it, Conti said. He told Mang that it was time to man up. Conti recommended that CDD do turn up the heat on Mang by having district council file a lawsuit against Mang, who already had a lien slapped on his home. The board agreed to move ahead with the lawsuit and to seek an injunction to force Mang to bring the property into compliance. Meanwhile, one of Mang's La Crescenta Villa's neighbors appealed for mercy from the CDD2 board. Steve Kiley brought his home at 2816 Burgess Drive into compliance. However, he was facing $6,337 in fines. He said he did not receive final approval from the Architectural Review Committee until December. The board recognized that Kiley had actively been trying to bring his property into compliance and agreed to waive the fines. Some people, I don't know, they they just want to butt their head against the wall. It doesn't get them in there anywhere. I don't, I don't know. I just don't get it. They obviously don't watch this channel. We've warned people about that a hundred times. How many holes in ones of golf did we get this week? Looks like I've got one here. Robert Garcia got a hole in one at the Marsh View Pitching Putt on hole number 15. Well, congratulations, Robert, on your hole in one. How about a couple letters to the editor? To the editor, all this talk about the conditions of the village's golf courses comes down to only one thing, greed. Traveling around the villages, all you see is massive amounts of new construction, townhouses, apartments, complexes, etc. Massive is not an overstatement. This, I believe, is the reason the maintenance on our courses has virtually stopped. The money is being spent elsewhere. The owners should be aware if the money keeps going elsewhere, so will we. That's sent in by Ronald Harvey by the village of Hadley. Well, thanks, Ronald. Um, I appreciate your letter to the editor. To the editor, how about going back to cart sharing like we did before COVID-19? Individual golf carts is double wear and tear on the courses. That's sent in by James T. Rich from the village of Palo Alto. James, I agree. I mentioned that. Four golfers, four golf carts. Should be two. There's an overseeding problem. They quit doing that. I don't know why. It's beyond me. To the editor, dropping dog waste in disposable waste bins is awful. However, we have someone in our neighborhood in the Chatham Villages having the habit of dropping their dog waste in other people's curbside garbage. What is it with these people and their dog waste? We had one resident dropping his dog waste in our sewer until we caught him. These people should be fined and never allowed to own pets. They're just irresponsible dog owners that threaten the health of those in our community. That's sent in by Michael Scotto from the village of Chatham. Well, Michael, kicking your dog waste in them little bags into our sewer system is not good. It's been going on for a long time. It'll continue to go on. I don't think it'll ever stop. And it's still going on by your letter. It's still going on. And I don't think it'll ever go away. It, people just don't learn. They just don't think that any of this concerns to them. I don't know. I just don't get it. Okay. I believe that's going to be the news this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Please, if you'd like to, I wish you'd join my Patreon memberships. You can get in at $2 a month. There you'll find a lot of things that you don't see on here. Everything that you see on there, no matter what level you're on, everything there is commercial free. And if you're like me, I hate commercials. Also there, only my Patreon members and my YouTube members will get the invitation to come to our members lunch. We don't have them every month. It's an average about every two, maybe three months. We all get together somewhere around here and uh, we just get together and have lunch and talk about whatever. It's fun. I've been to every one of them and I, th I just think they're a fun time. Hopefully we have our next one. Linda will be back by then. She can come to them because she enjoys meeting all you people too, just like me and Sue do. Last thing to be said is please subscribe. That counts for a lot. Subscribe on my videos. I really appreciate it. So take care. Be well. Stay safe. And don't leave your keys in the golf cart.